Hello, and welcome to The Writing Coach. I'm your host, Kevin Johns. On this podcast, I speak with the instructors, editors, coaches, and mentors that help writers and authors create their art, build their audience, and sell their work. In this episode, I speak with author Jenny Blake. The writer in its natural habitat, you know? I finally got it. I don't believe in drills. As a former teacher, I believe in authentic writing and and really getting into your story. I think it's each one of our responsibilities that when we learn a particular craft, I think it's kind of your responsibility to share it so that we can take storytelling to a new level. My mom doesn't understand. My dog just doesn't seem to get it when I talk to him. But when I go to my mastermind group, they get it. They understand we speak the common language. Keep writing. Keep creating. Never, ever stop. Life doesn't stop. So we got to keep on creating to continue creating the life that we want to create. You're listening to You're listening to the right coach. 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 Hello, dear listener, and welcome back to The Writing Coach. On the show today, we're going to talk about a really difficult topic for some people, change. How do you manage change in your career as an author or as a business person? And to join me to talk about this topic is the one, the only, Jenny Blake. Jenny is a speaker, a career coach, an author, and a business strategist. She lives in New York City, and she's getting ready to launch her new book, Pivot, the only move that matters is your next one. So in the discussion that Jenny and I have today, she talks about how her authorial voice has changed since her last book, Life After College, which came out five years ago. The role she's letting serendipity play in her approach to book marketing. Her method for balancing practical organizations and systems with intuition and faith what her definition of success now looks like, how the ideas in this book helped her through an especially difficult time in her life, why people making an impact in the world are often the ones in a constant state of pivoting, and how to better navigate change via your inner riskometer, and much, much more. It's a great conversation. I always love talking with Jenny, so let's cut to that interview now. So uh, welcome back to the show, Jenny. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. So when we last spoke, we were talking about JennyBlake.me, and we were still kind of following up on some life after college stuff, but you've got a whole new book now that you're building up towards the release to, Pivot. Yes, exactly. Pivot, the only move that matters is your next one, which I'm really excited about. So you've been working on this project for some time. You know, last time we spoke, I I think it was already kind of one of your main focuses at that time. Um, So this this book's a big deal for you. This is going to be a big launch. Yeah, it will come out five and a half years after my first book. And I've been working on it, thinking about it for, I would say, a solid three years and then writing the manuscript about a year and a half. And now we're in this window of doing the final copy edits and getting ready for the launch in September. So about six months now to plan the marketing for it. So with that gap between books, do you feel nerves in terms of some sort of pressure to get something out quicker? Or is that the publishing schedule that you're kind of comfortable with? Well, it's funny because people disparage traditional publishing for being so slow and say that that's one of the drawbacks. And Originally, my book was supposed to come out in March of 2016, and then because we were behind schedule, partly because of all the deep work my editor and I were doing on the manuscript, which I was very grateful for, now they wanted to push it to September. And so that, in a way, would have been fuel for the fire for anyone who says, oh, it's so slow, you don't have control over the process. But after a few days of being worried about that delay in the launch, I realized it's the best possible thing that could have happened. And I, at no point in this process have, have I felt like it's been slow. I actually feel like I'm working really hard around the clock and hard in a good way to make it the best quality book that I can. And for that reason, it doesn't feel slow. It feels slow in a good way to 
really put the the best that I can into it and, and the highest quality product. So having six months to think about marketing is actually a relief and I'm so glad. And if it had come out in March, I would have been scrambling over the holidays and not able to take a break. And I didn't realize until I turned in the final draft of the manuscript how much of a break I really needed. Your last book was written in a very specific style. I think you kind of called, you had a, a catchphrase for it that was something like uh, a book for the Twitter generation, right? right. It was written in a very succinct style. Are you continuing that style with Pivot or have you approached this book with a different narrative voice? This one is different. It's, it was a stretch for me. The first book I felt that's what I knew how to write. Tips, quotes, questions, and coaching exercises. It really was like a potpourri in a portable life coach. This book really did involve digging in, doing more research, writing more stories. So it stretched me as a writer. To, to, and I would say the format will be more similar to what you're probably used to reading in business books. But I did still try to incorporate exercises and things throughout that would really get someone thinking. Because I think it's it's one thing to read someone's methodology or process or philosophy, but the real benefit comes in from applying it to one's own life. So I try to put a nice mix. And then there are, I mean, of course, like my last book, I'm going to do a big toolkit online where people can really engage with templates and resources. Well, speaking of toolkit, you know, you're kind of the master of, of creating <laughs> these toolkits. And you had your kind of legendary book marketing template that we discussed last time. And I'm so curious, in five years since the last book, how much has your approach to book marketing changed? The first time around, I was really trying to wrap my head around all of it. At that point, I wasn't even running an online business. I was working at Google. I didn't know many authors. I had only just started connecting with this world. So every single aspect of it was brand new to me. Now that this is my core business and has been for five and a half years, there is a lot of activities that I'm doing that are that are just a natural part of running my business. So, so let's say that's a relief that I don't have to learn everything from scratch. And what's nice this time around is that all of the book marketing activities benefit the business and vice versa. Anything I'm doing to promote or get more business or pivot my business helps with the book as well. The biggest shift that I'm making is leaning into serendipity and magic. I really, that's my theme of 2016, and I picked that on purpose so that I don't run myself into the ground with this book launch. I think sometimes we have the image of the, fr the harried author who's doing events in different cities every day and uh, that it can get really overwhelming. And so I'm trying to surrender a little bit of that control of trying to make micromanage every aspect of the process and this time kind of trusting that I'll meet who I need to meet. And moreover, that once the book is launched, it will reach who it needs to reach. Of course, I'm going to work hard and do what I can to help ignite getting this message out there. But at the same time, I, I believe that books are like kids. And the minute they're out in the world, they have their own personality that I don't get to control who my book reaches and how and, and really to trust and have faith that if this message resonates, someone who reads it will tell their friend and that they'll tell their friend. And so I'm looking forward to having some element of viral or guerrilla marketing to the extent that people resonate with the message. I'm so surprised to hear that you know, your, your, your focus word is, is magic and serendipity. Um, that's the last thing I expect to hear on the book marketing side from like the queen of spreadsheets, <laughs> right? Um, so is that a lesson you learned from the first book that to kind of trust or is this a change that you've incorporated to your approach to business and kind of life? It's a great question. It's really both. I mean, so I'm still going to be insanely organized. <laughs> don't, course, don't get me course. wrong. <laughs> but I think once that piece is under control, or I'm going to organize to the extent that it's helpful. Like, uh, you know, now I, at that time I wasn't using Evernote. So it's interesting now I'm a little torn of do I put this all in Evernote now or should I keep it in the spreadsheet? I'm still thinking about the best way. And I'm going to share a ton of more resources this time around for other authors on Things like how to write the proposal, how to structure a research collection in Evernote. So I'm, I still have plans to share a lot of that side of things of how I my systems on the back end. But I think I think there is a life and business and and book marketing next level of of being able to 
have maybe it, maybe it's more of a paradox or sort of a complementary set of skills. It's having organization, but it's also then having trust and faith and the kind of more spiritual side of things. And for me, it's just a huge relief to have both and to not overly concern myself with every last thing, but really to do what feels right and resonant and then follow the clues to what to do after that. Do you feel like the the work that you've done over the last decade and the business that you've built provides you with a sp- support structure that allows you to kind of lean into serendipity in that way? I'm just thinking of, of someone listening to this podcast, getting ready to release their first book. And, and I think them leaving it to serendipity is very different than Jenny Blake leaving it to serendipity. Do you know what I mean? I know what you're saying. I think... I think both. I mean, so I'll give you an example with my first book, because maybe that's more like the position that you just described that someone might be in. And I almost think it's a misconception of, oh, unless I have a bigger platform, then I can't trust my intuition intuition and serendipity. And when actually it might be even more important for that person, because they don't have an automatic list of 10,000 that they can just say, hey, go buy my book. You know, it's, it's actually the earlier author that might want to lean into those things more. An example is when my first book was coming out, I had this goal to get on the Today Show. I just thought that that was how I would know I had made it as an author. And I, at one point, had a friend in PR who the Today Show asked her to FedEx overnight my book to them. And that was really exciting. And I thought it was going to happen. And then it didn't. They never followed up. And I was at a conference, and I remember there was a speaker there who was a regular on Good Morning America. And after her talk, I walked with her from, you know, the stage to the door so she could leave. And I said, how do I get on these morning shows? And she looked at me and said, that is not at all the right question. She's like, that's so uninspiring. That's all about you. And why do you want to be on a morning show? What about it? To sell a lot of books? She's like, she's like why don't you focus on reaching a lot of people? Why, why would you have this artificial goal? And when she said that, a light went off in me, and I thought, you know what? She's absolutely right. That goal is kind of meaningless. It's just a it's just a feather in her cap. It's like trying to make the New York Times bestseller list. Why? I mean, so I have the pride of being able to say that I did that. It's, it's a little – it just seems a little off to me because my books are uh, an act of service. It's meant to help be as helpful as possible to as many people as possible. So I dropped the Today Show goal, and not a month later – All of a sudden, I get an email saying Target wants to buy 15,000 copies of your book. And um, I had nothing to do with that deal. It was someone, a distribution rep, who Mm -hmm. made the deal. So I had nothing to do with it, didn't have to do anything. And now Target bought 15,000, which was much more meaningful than a Today Show appearance because the morning shows don't actually move that many books. And now Target was buying 15,000 non-refundable, which helped me earn out my advance in the first year, get a bonus for doing that, and then kicked me into royalties. So there's a great example. And, and, I, and I look back to that every time I, I think about why am I setting a certain goal. And it, the serendipity piece, there's still something active in putting yourself in front of interesting people and opportunities. But then the corollary is surrendering the outcome. So what sort of goals have you set for yourself then with this book? Like what is going to make you feel like you, this book was a success? You know, if something like being on the Today Show is no longer, you know, <laughs> a, a, a yardstick, right? A measurement of, of success for you. What does success for this book um, mean to you? It's really, for me, it's measured in people who read it and say, that really helped me. I really needed that. Or that they read it and they tell a friend. So to me, the success is the utility in the book. And I would love to earn, earn out my advance. You know, I would love for this book to go into royalties. I think that would let me know that, okay, it's going to last. It's, it's that I'm going to do a bunch of launch activities, but the, the book will, I would love for it to be an evergreen, a perennial seller that, it, that even if it doesn't make a list the first week out of the gate, that it sells steadily and consistently over time, and that if this book helps one person, I mean, truly, it's already a success to me. I know this might sound cheesy, but I did the best I could in writing it, and these are my best ideas. It's what helped me get through a really, really tough time in my life. So I feel successful for having written it, and for every person, whether it's one, five, five hundred, or 50,000 who then benefit, that to me is the measure of success. 
You mentioned the the concepts in this book help you through a difficult time. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, I was. So Life After College came out in 2011, and that's when I decided to leave Google. And I kind of rode the adrenaline of that for for about a year. And I did a bunch of podcasts on the book and leaving Google. But both were about leaving something, leaving college mm. and Google. And I started to feel that I had outgrown that message. And part of the reason I left Google was I didn't want to be defined by my working there anymore. And here it still was the case on the other side. And I felt like, what am I moving toward? And I just couldn't see anything on the horizon. And so pivoting in and launching then JennyBlake.me, I launched in the middle of 2013. That was an effort to at least create an umbrella that was bigger than life after college and say, you know, I'm turning 30, <laughs> like, and I'm not saying that that's old, but I'm just saying it's not really a what a recent college grad is thinking about. And so at least at JennyBlake.me, I could explore systems at the intersection of mind, body, and business, things like travel and solopreneurship and creativity. But still, that's really broad. And so that year was a lot of soul searching. I was going through a breakup. I had fights with some of the people that I'm closest to. And my business, I really put on hold because I didn't feel right coaching and speaking while I was in the middle of such inner turmoil and transition. And I was meditating every day, journaling, going to yoga, not drinking alcohol for the whole year. And still, it was so challenging. And by the end of that year, I had to move out of the apartment I was living in in New York. And in getting to a new place, had to put three months security deposit, which wiped out my remaining savings. And that move, the cost of the move. So now here I was in January of 2014, not sure how I was going to pay February rent, not sure if I should just go get another job, throw in the towel. Maybe the jig is up. Maybe I'm not cut out for solopreneurship. And I did the best I could, but it is now my time to, to call it quits. And in my gut, in my heart, I knew I didn't want to, but I was afraid. And I also didn't know how I was going to work my way out of this. And as I looked at all the self-help and business books on my shelves, I felt angry that I've read hundreds of books since I was 15. And why weren't any of them working? Why was I still in this pickle? And so in trying to solve that for myself and figure out how the heck to work my way out of this and not have to fold my business, that's really when I came up with the methods that I describe in Pivot. Well, let's dig into the book. What does Pivot mean? Pivot is a methodical shift. It's logical, methodical shift where you double down on what's working to pivot or move into a new direction. And it's a pivot, not a leap. So that's part of the message is that you don't have to start from scratch. There are things in your life, even if it's only 5% or 10% that are working and that you do enjoy. And so it's about taking those and doubling down on them to move methodically in a new direction and doing that through small experiences and, and experiments that are rooted in a person's strengths. So is this book for someone who's at a similar spot as you were, where we're, they're at that point where in their life where they're saying, maybe what I'm doing isn't working or only part of it is? I, I guess, tell me a bit Absolutely. about who is the, the target reader of this book. Well, there's, there's a couple levels because certainly someone could be at their own pivot point and this moment of either feeling plateau, oh, I'm kind of bored, or all-out crisis, <laughs> like, help, how do we get out of this? <laughs> but then as I was writing the book, it was fascinating to realize that we're anyone who really is interested in learning and growth and making an impact on the world, I call them impactors, are pivoting, are kind of in a constant state of pivot. We're either just coming out of one or we're thinking about our next one, and we're always, we actually thrive on some amount of growth and uncertainty. And so truly, even though this book can be, and should be applied by someone who's right in the middle of a pivot themselves or at a pivot point. It's also a, a mindset for us all to adopt and a method, the four stage process that we can be doing continuously. And if we have a pivot mindset, then the turns don't have to be so sharp. We can more naturally and continuously pivot as a, as a habit rather than a shocking midlife or quarter life crisis because that that crisis feeling is only going to happen more often in this economy that we live in a couple of years ago I, I spent a lot of time 
trying to master Facebook and Facebook marketing. And recently I was talking to my father about it. My father was saying, well, you know, at least, you know, you have all that knowledge that you put into that. And I was like, dude, that was like two years ago. Nothing I learned then is applicable now. Um, as you were saying, but like, especially with social media and with, with modern marketing and stuff, we are in this state of constant pivoting. I, I, I'm sure many of your readers, like myself, probably find that overwhelming and terrifying. So how do you take the reader from that state of, of overwhelm that, oh my God, everything I learned about social media eight months ago doesn't apply anymore to this mindset where, that, that you're, you're um, discussing here that, that's kind of a, a state of constant pivoting that you're, you're happy and comfortable with and that's obviously making you more successful, not terrified and right. wanting to crawl up into a ball. Right. Oh, you brought up so many great points in there. Number one, recognizing that we all are facing this confusion and this conundrum of if I learn something and it's so quickly out of date or I have friends or people I featured in the book that got a job and three months later they were laid off to no fault of their own, just as the company restructured or got acquired. And it was really wild. Nobody I interviewed, almost no one I interviewed was in the same place when I was doing my fact checking at the end. So I still can't keep up with the people featured in the book because of how often things are changing. And that surprised me. I, I, I mean, I knew there was some amount of more frequent change going on, but when I started working on the book, I thought, okay, we're going to change, be changing now every few years. And the interviews, the people I tracked showed that for most it was happening every six months to a year. And not because they're job hoppers, but just because the, Again, cir circumstances that a lot of times were even outside of their control. So one, the, the, the not taking it personally. All right, things are changing. That's scary. I'm scared. That's okay. That's kind of how you're going to feel. Change is scary because we do like some amount of safety and security. But on another level, it's an illusion. I mean, change is the only constant. This is the saying as old as time, but in our lives, we really like to pretend that we have security and that things don't have to change. And if only I create the, the perfect spreadsheet, <laughs> you know, or <laughs> have the right habits and routines and I work hard, things don't have to change. And that's just not true. So accepting the nature of change. And then what you described are three levels. There's mindset, and then there's meta skills, and then there are what's called micro skills. And so the micro skills are like the day-to-day -day tactics, and you're absolutely right. Learning Facebook marketing or social media is a great example of one that is constantly changing right underneath your feet. But then maybe the meta skill is marketing in general, you know, the type of business that you're doing, reaching people, providing value and resources for other authors, you know, having a level of skill or strength that that you get to keep with you, that, that the form and the outlets might change, whether it's through Facebook or a podcast, but that you're continuing along this, what I call project-based purpose. So it doesn't have to be your life purpose, but right now you have this project of helping other authors. And then the mindset is, is really the root of all of this, which is being open to change, being having an eye out for what you'd be most excited to learn and do next, and then evaluating what's currently working best and how you can do more of it. So if we're looking at that kind of three-tiered structure, do you recommend people start at one level, like start at mindset and then move down to micro skills or start at micro skills and move the other way? Or does it depend on um, the problem they're trying to solve? It depends on the problem. I would say what the book, the way the book is structured, the first section is called plant. If you think about a basketball player, they, they ground down with their plant foot and then they scan for opportunity with their pivot foot. And that's mm. the analogy that I use when I think about pivoting. Planting is about understanding who am I? What am I really interested in? What am I great at? And the other part of planting is what I call putting a pin in it. Where are you going? A year from now, what would you love to have happening in your life and your work? What does smashing success look like? If you were recognized for an award, what would that be? If someone sent you a thank you email, what would it say? And that's that. You, you almost asked me something similar earlier. But that's the that's planting not just in what's working now, but where do you want to be a year from now, even if you don't know specifics. And that then creates this gap. You are here and you want to go here. Imagine plotting your destination on a Google map. Well, now we can brainstorm how to best bridge that gap. And that's where scanning for things like new skills comes in. There could be two, two people. One person might love learning every new Facebook update and change to the platform and always being the one on top of it. 
And then another person might find that absolutely exhausting and realize, I got to get out of this Facebook marketing business. <laughs> so that's where it's up to each individual to really go inward and say, does this really resonate? Does this bring me joy or does it feel like I should, something I should know and should learn? You mentioned some case studies and interviews in the book with people who were either kind of bored with where they were at or were faced at a challenge point. Are there other people who are pivoting? They're already, things are going great and they're taking it to a next level um, of greatness via a pivot? Absolutely, yeah. That's because that's who this book is for. It's people who, who really have high aspirations for themselves and for others. And so that's that's kind of why my hope is actually that in a way, the people who I want to read this book probably don't need it. Like, you know, in a certain sense, they're already kicking ass and taking names. And then in another, it's like, well, we can get even better at how we navigate change. And, and so if we can reduce the time that we spend spinning or frustrated at ourselves and, and can learn this method, well, then we can just accelerate what we're doing and, and getting our work out there into the world. I think as human beings, you know, I certainly see this as a writing coach that we are so comfortable with the status quo, even if we don't like the status quo, right? I can sit down with a client and have a conversation about how they're not happy, their book's not moving along fast enough, you know, they're not happy with their current career, they really want to be an author, and yet they still don't make that change to get the writing in. So how does the book address that rut, right, that that as human beings we kind of get ourselves into and then... It takes so much to get ourselves out of if we do want to make a pivot. Right. I call that your inner riskometer, which is your (laughs) how you are looking at risk. And so we all have a comfort zone. But if we stay there too long and start to turn into a stagnation zone, if we ignore that, it gets into a panic zone where we're just downright have to make a change. Our body starts shutting down. And so the, the key is to go from the comfort zone to the stretch zone, but not stretch so far that you're then panicked in the other direction. And so a lot of times I think people, exactly what you said, they they stick with the status quo because of this idea that, well, the devil I know is better than the devil I don't. At least I know this devil. And I've heard so many people say that when they're in a job that they're so bored out of their mind. But if they change, oh, they're going to have to learn something new and work's really going to take energy and effort again. And there's a part of them resisting that. So the pivot mindset and pivot approach is what are some small experiments you can run to get you out of your comfort zone and test your stretch zone. Then the whole idea is you don't have to do this 180 overnight. So for the person who isn't writing at all, most likely they're thinking in terms of all or nothing, a very linear approach to this goal to be a writer. Unless I write every day, I'm not a writer. And I've heard people say that. Instead, can you write for 15 minutes a week? That's doable. That's an experiment. And then when they sit down for 15 minutes, well, how does it go? Or an hour? Is time flying? Maybe they want to sit for two hours. And maybe they, maybe it's the whole time it's grueling and they realize, oh, I don't want to be a writer at all. I want to start a podcast. And that's how I want to share my thoughts with the world. So it's only through doing those experiments, but without the expectation to launch 100% into that overnight. I'm about to make a pivot with my business. I've Mm -hmm. I've been doing a ghostwriting business and a coaching business for the last couple of years. And, you know, exactly like we've been discussing, it's time to kind of double down on what's working and cut out or reduce what's not. Obviously, you can't sum up a whole book in one tip. But is there if you could say one thing to, to someone who's literally about to make a pivot in his business this week or, you know, this month, what advice should I take from this book mm. or from you? Well, first, this is very exciting. <laughs> what are you most excited about? In, in terms of making the pivot? Yeah. And what's on the other side? Focus is what I'm most excited about. I've I've been too scattered for the last couple of years, um, you know, trying to get coaching clients, trying to serve my coaching clients, trying to get ghostwriting clients, trying to serve those clients. And I'm really looking forward to focusing in on on the on one of them and really, you know, being able to go 100 percent and not feeling so scattered all the time. That's awesome. Okay, humor me for a second because this will help me <laughs> give my best nugget. And so for you, a year from now, what does smashing success look like in this new area with focus? You know, you know I don't want to say it, but okay. I think my my measurement of success to a certain extent is financial. And, um, you know, there's certain 
financial thresholds I want to reach with the business. And I, I know I'm, it sounds shallow and I should have no, that. I mean, I obviously, it. I want to serve my clients and do great work. I, I mean, ultimately, I guess that's what success is going to be for me is, is going to be a handful of clients who are utterly thrilled with what I've helped them accomplish. I, I guess that's just difficult to measure and, and the fallback becomes kind of a, a revenue <laughs> target. Well, it's, it's so important because food, clothing, and shelter are our most fundamental needs. So I, I'm, I, there's a whole chapter on financial terms for pivoting. So you're in good company and I oh, think good, it's good. so important. And I, I did a podcast on how to optimize for revenue and joy. I really think they're equally important. And then we could say impact as well. But yeah, without the financial piece in the success definition, why are we running a business? You know, <laughs> it's like I totally get it. So then for you, I would say that, well, the best piece of advice always in pivot, I think it, it just has to do, and this is where the subtitle comes from, the only move that matters is your next one. And I've had a lot of fun playing with that concept, which is, well, what's one next experiment that you could do that puts you in your stretch zone and that moves you toward that financial goal? And so I think reflecting on that, putting an anchor, having that, putting a pin in it in your map of where you want to be financially, and maybe you put a financial goal, a joy goal, you know, what would actually make you happy and then an impact goal and what would, what would success look like across all three of those? And then what's one next experiment that you can do? Or in your case, something you can say no to, which you're in the process of doing, Mm -hmm. which is also, it's not, I don't put a lot of this in the book, but a huge part of pivoting is saying no to something Mm -hmm. that's often good. There's nothing terrible about any of the other business channels that you described, but yet you still want to say no to create room for something great. Right. Exactly. Well, we started the interview with you talking about embracing the mystical. Um, I'm going <laughs> to close it up with kind of a, possibly the answer is mystical, but maybe there is a real kind of strategic answer behind this. And it's going to sound like I'm kissing your butt a little bit here, but this is a genuine question. Okay. So I'm not, <laughs> okay, not kissing. <laughs> you know, I've interviewed hundreds of people for this podcast and another podcast. And I would say that, you know, of the hundreds of people, or or maybe we'll say 100 people I've interviewed, you are my favorite guest. There is something intangible about you as an, as a interviewee. That's wonderful. Are you able to speak to that? Is that something inherent in your nature that you kind of bring that, that, I mean, I guess what appeals to me always is like your intelligence matched with your approachableness and optimism and friendliness. But um, is that just who you are or is there a strategy behind behind that kind of magic that you bring to to a podcast interview? Wow. Well, I am so honored, beyond honored. You have no idea. I'll tell you a secret, which is that I am often very self-conscious on an interview like this when I share some of the more spiritual or mystical, as you called it, that side, because I don't know if people are open to hearing it. And I used to, every time I would say anything along those lines, preface it by saying, this might be really woo-woo, and just sort of diminish it before it even came out of my mouth. And so actually, Kevin, yours is one of the first where I'm just trying to own it. And it's been such a part of my inner world. And someone asked me the other day, wow, you think on such a deep level, the books you read about, I don't do that. And I said, like, maybe be grateful, because really, there's just so much chaos going on in my inner world, (laughs) at least for the first 31 years of my life. I'm 32 now. This was the only way I could just manage the chaos that I felt in my brain. And the reason of writing Pivot is I just reached such low moments around trying to muscle through every aspect of change that I kind of had to lean into a more spiritual approach. And now, as you mentioned earlier, it is spilling into the book marketing and I don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you and I will have to see, we'll be the judges of whether this magic and serendipity approach works or it falls flat on its face. You know, I'm not really sure, but I will say I, I don't think a book to me, to me, writing a book is a spiritual process because I I have lots of ideas, but also every time I got stuck in my meditation, I would I would also ask for guidance. And I feel I think a lot of authors feel when they really get into a, a work or a creative project, part of it is being channeled. And I'm just I'm a messenger, you know. I'm not 
fully the one in control of this message, and a lot of it has been around for thousands of years. So anyway, Kevin, you've made my day and my week. I'm thank you for the kind words, and and the only secret that I have is just learning to harness my own neuroses and insecurity and transform it for the good of other people. So if anyone listening feels that they have that inner chaos going on, it's actually a great gift. Jay, I think that's the definition of a writer right there, right? I think you exactly. just nailed it. So I think we better wrap it up there because you're not, we're not going to get it any better uh, for this show than that. So where, when can folks expect the book and where can they pre-order, pick it up, support you with the launch? Thank you so much. It comes out September 6th with Portfolio Penguin, and there is an Amazon page up, but there's nothing on there yet. So in the meantime, people can keep in touch at JennyBlake.me. I do a newsletter every two weeks with my favorite links, videos, books from around the web, and tools, which is some people tell me they only read it for the tool of the week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, that's the best way to get in touch, and I'm on Twitter at Jenny underscore Blake. Jenny, I know how busy you are, so I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show again and uh, talk to our listeners and share you know, your awesome personality as well as knowledge and experiences. And I know um, I can't wait to read the book, and, and I'm sure the listeners are, are going to snap up a copy as well. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you to everybody for listening and wishing you all the best on your, your own creative project. So there you have it, my interview with Jenny Blake. You know, there's a Bob Dylan quote uh, in his song, Not Dark Yet, and it says that behind every beautiful thing, there's been some kind of pain. And I think uh, Jenny revealed some of that in today's conversation. I think it's really interesting, especially for me to look at someone like Jenny, who's so accomplished and who I look up to and see that she's had her own challenges and that a lot of the amazing things that she's been able to bring into the world are a result of the challenges and the pain that she's been through in her own life. And, uh, you know, change can be painful and that kind of being the theme of today's podcast um it's not easy but when you take pain and challenge uh, and change and and all of those difficult feelings that we get faced with sometimes and when you're able to take that and turn that into something like art or a book that helps people it could be a pretty magical thing so you know I I think Jenny said it better than I can so I was gonna finish up the episode here Uh, I'm gonna quote back what Jenny said you know, the only secret that I have is learning to harness my own inner neuroses and insecurity and transform it for the good of other people. So if anyone listening feels like they have that inner chaos going on, it's actually a great gift. Thanks for listening, guys. See you next episode. <laughs> <laughs>